Welcome to the Association 4.0 podcast, your association's no-fluff playbook to navigating and thriving in Industry 4.0 or the digital marketplace. Each week, we bring expert insights to help you and your association stay ahead of the curve. Hello, my name is Sherry Budziak, and I'm the host of Association 4.0 podcast. I'm also the founder of .org Source, a management consultancy for associations and founder of .org Community. Today, my guest is Dick Dupinski, who is the Director of Communications at the Experimental Aircraft Association. EAA is the only association that offers the fun and camaraderie of participating in flying, building, and restoring of recreational aircraft with the most passionate community of aviation enthusiasts. Welcome, Dick. It's so exciting to have you here with me today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's kind of, as we record this, it's not a great day for flying. It's snowing here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So let's talk about flying instead. All right, great. So tell me a little bit about your background. Well, my background, I've been at EA now for 30 years, um, came out of broadcast journalism, actually, uh, radio and, and TV is my background. And back in the early 90s, they were looking for someone to join the communication staff as the number three person who liked airplanes and could write a little bit. And I, I seem to fulfill that. And so uh, joined in and have been here ever since, been director of communications since 2010 and just um had a world of fun and can talk about airplanes all day long. So it's uh, it really has uh, been a rewarding career and a rewarding job and uh, uh, really went a different direction than when I was um, a college kid thinking of what I was going to do with my life. Well, that's great. Well, you do have a great radio voice. That's for well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the Experimental Aircraft Association sounds so interesting to be able to, to work there and, and, and i um, interested to hear about the organization. So describe the organization and the, your current professional responsibilities to the audience a little bit. Sure. Uh, EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association, is actually coming up on its 70th anniversary. It was founded in January 1953 as a local club of people who built and restored airplanes in the Milwaukee area. And since then, it's grown to include anybody who enjoys recreational aviation. We right now have 260,000 members in about 105 countries. Uh, we have 900 chapters, mostly in the U.S., that promote and support grassroots aviation in their communities. And a lot of people who are involved in aviation, whether it's building aircraft, restoring aircraft, flying airplanes, or just like being around airplanes and the people who are in it, because Aviation as a recreation is certainly a, a passion-filled uh, pursuit. It is something that if you talk to a bunch of pilots, you'll notice a couple of things. They love to talk about flying, and they always talk with their hands as if they're <laughs> going someplace or another. Uh, and so my responsibilities here is really connecting the outside world to EAA. It's getting people to understand what it is for people who fly. It's not the the rich guys, it's not all of that. Most people who fly are very much of average means. They save up, they're part of flying clubs, they build their own airplane to save money from kits and sets of plans, and they go out and this is their hobby. They pursue that. And uh, I try to make that connection to people, whether it's the media, whether it's uh, clubs and groups, whether it's in situations like this, talking to professionals who and my own peer group. And so it's a lot of fun doing that. And it's Part of what I really enjoy is, I guess, spreading the gospel a little bit about aviation and saying it is for the average person. It's something people can reach out to either as a profession or just as a hobby. Yeah, that's great. So um, I understand that AirVenture is your annual mega event uh, meeting um, attended by flight enthusiasts from all over the world. So tell me about that event and how you were impacted over the last two years um, and how those experiences has kind of changed um, the business. Yeah, it's uh, Air Venture, first of all, for people who are not familiar, it is the world's largest fly-in convention. And it's held in Oshkosh, Wisconsin in late July. And every year we get more than 600,000 attendants and more than 10,000 airplanes that come to Oshkosh for a week. And this becomes 
the busiest airport in the world. It's busier than O'Hare. It's busier than Hartsfield. It's busier than Denver. Uh, we will have a takeoff and landing on the average of every 10 to 15 seconds taking place here. And that's the average. Wow. And so at times when we have all the runways going, we could have six airplanes landing at the same time here in Oshkosh as you lead up into the event. And you will see everything here from the smallest ultralight, one person ultralight, all the way up to massive airliners, a 747, a C-5 from the Air Force and so forth, and everything in between. Uh, it is, uh, I'd like to call it aviation's family reunion, because no matter what you like to fly, what you're interested in, it will be here at some time. When the Concorde was flying, uh, it came here five times. And wow. the first time it came here in the mid 80s, it was actually uh, the only of the three places it had landed was New York, Washington, Dulles and Miami. And the fourth place was Oshkosh, Wisconsin, of all the crazy <laughs> things that you would think of. But uh, that it attracts people from all over the world, um, everybody from average pilots all the way up to astronauts, airline pilots, military pilots uh, and so forth. Um the last two years have indeed been interesting. Uh, in 2020, like a lot of big public events, we had to cancel because of the COVID, pro, uh, COVID pandemic. And that was something that had not been done before. And this is going to be our 70th fly-in this year. And so in the first 68 years, it was never canceled. And wow. it just, uh, and so we had to come back in 21. And that was a little bit different because a lot of the protocol were still in place. Uh, and it really did affect people, much like 9-11 affected people in a security sense. The COVID pandemic affected people in a health sense. Uh, there were great discussions about uh, masking, not masking. How clean do you make things? How, how do you spread out crowds and so forth? And a lot of those protocols have eased, thankfully, in the year plus since then. But a lot of them we've taken in, and it's become part of what we do, uh, going with companies, extra cleanliness. What do you do in, in things like restrooms and public areas and so forth to keep things clean with that amount of people coming through? So it really has made us more mindful in a lot of ways of what our responsibility to our members and visitors happen to be at the event, especially when you'll have a hundred thousand plus people coming in every day and every single day for an entire week. So it, it really is um, fascinating to work through the logistics of that as well. And it has changed the way we've um, operated sanitation, the way we've operated our business practices, ticketing, and a lot of other things. Hmm. So, you know, as I think about Air Venture, it's like your employees have their year-round responsibilities, right? But then, but then you have Air Venture, and those roles sometimes are have broadened their responsibilities and might go beyond anything that they're doing day to day. So, kind of explain a little further about you know how that all works for your organization. It is. It's uh, you know, Air Venture. Uh, it's sometimes the eight hundred pound gorilla of our year because you know it's it's so big, so massive. You have so many people showing up that it's all hands on deck, and you get thrown into positions that you might not expect. Uh, we will have people from the IT department who will be suddenly in charge as staff liaison to an aircraft parking area, uh, and we have five thousand volunteers that work the event. So suddenly you're working with a group of volunteers that may number in several hundred and making sure they're getting what they need and so forth. So what you find out is, first of all, uh, you find out who your potential leaders are in an organization mm -hmm. because you give them these responsibilities. And sometimes we're amazed at how some of the people who we thought, okay, that's an IT person, or they might be an HR, or they're over in the finance department, suddenly step up in this leadership position and have an opportunity to do that with a large group of people. And you go, wow, they have more gifts than maybe we realized, or maybe they even realized to do that. Uh, and then supporting them and, and building that. So it, it does give our employees a great deal of confidence. Uh, it, is, it is something that we tell new employees it's nothing like you'll experience any place else because in this job, what we do for that week is done by nobody else in the world to this size and scope. And you can tell some of them, their eyes get really big and they go, oh boy. And uh, so it is interesting to watch how 
they become part of the culture as well and telling them about the history and the volunteers and what it means for people around the world when they come to Oshkosh uh, and bringing them into it. It's an important part of, if not our onboarding process, certainly as the the culture acclimation process that we might have within the organization. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of switch topics a little bit. Um, You know, I'm thinking about, you know, I think we're all thinking about how we're communicating with members differently today. So are you communicating with your members differently today than you did a couple of years ago? Oh yeah. It's, it's so much different now. Um, the immediacy of communications and the demand for yeah. immediacy on communications has really forced us to up the game in a lot of ways. Um, the one thing you learn about social media is it is a beast that must be fed yeah. and it becomes a two-way conversation. Uh, and I also, I'll tell small organizations who are saying, well, should we should get a social media feed. We should get a Facebook page. And I often tell them, if you're going to do that, you better have somebody ready to respond because people take it as a conversation. Unlike a website where you present information or tell people or even put up video or a podcast and it's a one-way street coming through, a social media account is a two-way street. Be ready for the conversation, Mm -hmm. be ready for people to engage you, and you better be ready to engage back because that's the expectation from that. So bringing that into the realm certainly is something, uh, you know, I think about when even as close as 15, 20 years ago, we did a majority of our discussion with our members via phone, email, or, you know, those who are very young listening to this podcast, there was a thing called a fax machine that spit out paper (laughs) with messages on it. And, uh, you know, you, you think about that and what it is now that um, with chat uh, through your website or through your membership services or through your social media uh, feeds and so forth, uh, we have people that are dedicated to responding people through social media or through our chat room. And that has changed so much in recent years. And uh, as sometimes the urgency or the demands of responses have shortened. Nobody's going to wait around for six hours anymore to right. say, okay, we're going to get, we're going to get through the pile of emails and get back to you. Uh, no, they're sending stuff out and it's the classic, why haven't you responded to my text? I sent it 35 seconds ago, uh, right. those type of things. And so those type of demands on associations, there's good and bad in it. Uh, it the good is you can get instant feedback. You can provide information, provide knowledge, tamp down rumors fairly quickly. But there is the demand now that somebody has to be on it at all times and be ready to respond in a very timely fashion. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point for people to, to keep in mind. Um, It was interesting the last month or so we've been, we do a lot of work in website kind of usability and product development and we were doing some research and one of the, we're for a physician organization and some of the doctors said, we don't go to the association for X, Y, Z information anymore. We go to TikTok. There's these doctors on TikTok. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you guys, I was like, you, that's, you heard that wrong. They're like, no, no, Sherry, that's what they said. So I looked at the notes, I looked up the names of the doctors and I started following them on TikTok. And I was like, okay, this really. Um, but that's, you know, it's that's the world we're, that's the world we're living in. So, yep. um, yeah. So it's that immediate, you know, as you said, kind of that immediate response, hurry up, get information, you know, even, you know, I can, I mean, I've had my kids say to me, like, I can learn anything on YouTube. Right. So, um, <laughs> so that's the expectation. So, um, so anyway, it's interesting uh, too, that you mentioned that Sherry, just to build on that a little bit, that, uh, different, demographics have different portals that they work through. You mentioned TikTok. We started using TikTok about a year ago, and we were stunned at not only how rapid it became accepted uh, that you're running these little TikTok videos of cool airplanes coming in. And, you know, here we are standing on the runway, you know, while, while the airliner or the C-5 is landing behind us. Or, and also the demographic, it opened up a whole new area for us in 18 to 35 
to reach out to them and engage them. A lot of them look at, yeah, I've got a Facebook account and that's where I talk to my grandmother. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I feel very old now, but you know, it's, <laughs> because I remember when Facebook was the new thing and then Twitter for the immediacy also has a role in it. And, and so uh, Instagram has been one of our fastest growing social media portals wow. just because aviation is so visual. Uh, yeah. People can, can do that quickly. So it's interesting to see what the needs are of the audiences, where the different audiences are. And we spend some time studying that too. Yeah. So what do you think that EAA's greatest challenges and opportunities are? Well, the greatest opportunity really is aviation is still such a an open field for people to engage in. And there's so much promise, um, not only for young people, but for everybody to be involved. Uh, there, there's so much good. I, I can say earning my pilot certificate, uh, both the first solo flight I made and then earning the certificate, uh, I always regard as some of the the biggest accomplishments personally of my life because you consider it, you take this machine, you get in it, you throw yourself into the air, you land, and then you you can do it again and again, and you can go places. And it opens up a, a great deal of freedom. And with it comes a great deal of responsibility. So that opportunity is there, the lessons in it. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about STEM education for kids, uh, what, the, what the possibilities are there, uh, all of the science involved in aviation uh, from the technical end of piloting to weather uh, to math and so forth are all involved in the world of flight. Uh, you know, when you take a look at some of the challenges, you know, aviation is, is not a cheap pursuit to step into. It, it is something that uh, you have to have a certain sense of dedication, first of all, to earn a pilot certificate because it takes time. It's not something you're going to do in a weekend. It's something that takes, if you're getting a pilot, private pilot certificate, it's going to take at least 40 hours of training. And that's the minimum by law. Uh, so how do you get into it? How do you find the right people to do it? Um, how do you stay with it? How how do you keep mm -hmm. going when you hit the plateaus personally? All of those things become very much a, a part of what we hear back. Uh, we're working on programs now, for instance. It is said that of every 100 people who start flight training, only 20 go on to earn their pilot certificate. And we're going in, mm. why is that? Uh, what does that mean? Not only for the health and vitality of aviation and to give people this experience, but also for aviation associations such as ours saying that that's our membership base. That is where we're drawing people from. Um, so how do we get them engaged and so forth? And, and that's always a challenge. And how do we make aviation more accessible in all the ways that you can make it accessible, flying to engage people with it, to um, have them familiar with their local airport uh, on the outskirts yeah. of their city, whatever it happens to be. So what do you feel are the greatest challenges and opportunities for your members? For our members right now, um, the opportunities are out there. What, what's really nice about the modern communication tools that we've noticed, the opportunity to exchange information. Uh, you can have someone building or restoring an airplane in Fresno, California, and they can almost immediately connect now with somebody in Poughkeepsie, New York. And they don't have to wait for letters. You don't have to wait for manuals. There, there are so many opportunities to exchange information, uh, whether it's through us or other channels, through, through webinars and chat groups and uh, online forums and so forth. Uh, some of the biggest challenges for our members probably are first of all expense. Um, you know, prices yeah. never do go down, uh, whether it's for airplanes or hangar space and so forth. Uh, regulation certainly is another one. Uh, among all the the recreational pursuits you could think of, aviation is probably the most regulated out there. Uh, mm -hmm. I often kid people. I said if if people had to go through to drive what they have to go through to earn a pilot certificate, half the drivers wouldn't be on the road because mm -hmm. um, you know you have everything from, for instance, imagine if every two years uh, you had to go back to the DMV to take a a checkup road test to see if you've picked up any bad habits. Well, as a yeah. pilot, you get to do that with a flight review with a flight instructor to see, okay, am I still sharpen my skills? Uh, private pilot and beyond every two years, um, depending on your age, one to three years, uh, you get to go and have a medical checkup. 
and make sure that you have a medical oh, wow. certificate to go. You know, imagine if you had to do that to get a driver's license and even, you know, things like we do a walk around of our airplanes uh, before every flight. How many of us walk around our cars before we hop in and drive away? Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> you know, you, you, is that tire flat on the passenger side mm-hmm. in the back? You don't know because you never looked at it. You know, those type of things. So, you know, those are the things that are out there. Um, another big one coming up for recreational pilots is there is a move now toward unleaded fuel. And there are a lot of mm. uh, legacy aircraft and so forth that require higher octane leaded fuel right now. What is that going to look like in the next decade as that transition to unleaded fuel takes place? All of those things are part of the challenges for our members. And so they're coming to us to say, what is EAA doing about that? And um, those are the projects that we're involved in very deeply right now. Interesting. So, Dick, how does EAA manage change and transition? That is a challenge. That that always is, I think, for any organization, and especially yeah. for one um, that's been around for 70 years, such as EAA. And a lot of our members enjoy the tradition of aviation, going back to the biplanes and the World War II airplanes and uh, flying the, the small little Piper Cubs around and so forth. So there, a lot of the members hold on to tradition and legacy. Uh, very well. So pushing change and transition through a group like that sometimes can be daunting. Uh, I remember one thing that we had, uh, this was probably about 10, 12 years ago, uh, we changed the size of our magazine. We went from a basic eight and a half by 11 sheet size to a little more tabloid size, a little bit larger. Um, It worked better for printing. It worked better for a lot of reasons. uh, It as you looked at it, it was very vivid when you looked at it um, artistically and with the layout to have that. We got complaints from people saying that it no longer fit on their bookshelf. It no longer you know, fit in the little yearly holders to put their magazines in. And the best one I heard, it no longer fit on the back of their toilet when they set it there. <laughs> so you know, these type of things. So how do you manage that? Uh, the biggest thing uh, that with transition and change. And we went through it just recently for the first time in 22 years, we increased our yearly rates. Our, our, our oh, yeah. And it went up from $40 to $48. Not a large increase when you consider you've spread it over 22 years, uh, but inflation just did that. So we really came up with the idea of the classic, we're going to tell you what we're going to do and why. Uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to lock in for three years at the old rates if you do it by such and such a date. Mm. Um, and then we're going to keep explaining what, why the service is good for what you're paying for extra or what services we get to keep because of it. And so it really becomes a total package of saying, this change, this transition, this is why it's good. We're going to involve you. Let us know if you see something that could be better uh, and just keep that constant communication because uh, nobody likes surprises because usually surprises in the association world aren't good. Right. And, uh, right. Very rarely do you have one like, we have this great surprise. We're able to low do, lower dues $50 a year because of it. Um, yeah. That just doesn't happen. Right. So um, to tell people, this is why we're changing things and uh, and so forth. And I, I could tell a number of stories through changes we've had in the years where people have gone crazy for a little while, but then when it started, they looked around and went, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. Uh, but it's telling them this is where we're going and this is why. And the why is so important. And sometimes people forget that. They put out the quick memo or the quick email saying, this is where we're going. And they forget about the why or the why? nurturing that uh, along. And we'll say it in meetings a lot that a lot of us who have been discussing changes We've been talking about it for six months or a year. The people we're presenting it to are just hearing about it. It took six months or a year for us to become acclimated to it. So don't expect people to say, oh, that's a great idea. You made the right decision instantly. Uh, So that happens. So we've got to bring them along and nurture them as well, Sherry. Yeah, that's a really good point. So Dick, you started talking a little bit about, you know, the new generation and, and I want to hear from you. How are you guys attracting the new 
you know, new members, um, younger members? And are you experiencing any challenges bringing in younger people into the organization? Uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, the average age of the private pilot in the U.S. is around 55, 56 years old. And so it's really important to get young people involved in it because, you know, first of all, there's so many opportunities in the world of aviation as careers and so forth. And and just for fun, for we've seen young people who have taken to aviation who have just discovered themselves in it and saying, wow, what what a great sense of accomplishment, of freedom, of taking on this responsibility and carrying that with you. Uh, so one of the programs we're most proud of is our Young Eagles program. Uh, some 30 years ago this year, uh, we announced a program that we were going to have EA member volunteers who were pilots fly kids, introduce them to aviation, show them what it was like to fly an airplane and so forth. Real brief 15, 20 minute flight, take them out there. And we set a goal of having a million kids by 2003, the centennial of the Wright Brothers flight. What happened is we reached that goal two months early. Wow. And we had, we've had more than 50,000 pilots participate in donating their time, the fuel, the airplane to go fly kids. And now we're up to nearly 2.3 million kids who have been flown. And we know that more than 25,000 of today's pilots under the age of 40, 45 got their start as young eagles. And so hmm. we know it's working. Um, and that takes time and it takes effort and it takes nurturing of our membership to say, this is worthwhile. Go out there and fly kids for free. And I can tell you, having flown young eagles myself, I don't know who has more fun, fun the kids or us as pilots, because it is a blast to take kids up there and start showing them what their school looks like, what their neighborhood looks like from the air. That's and, cool. um, it, you know, to see that wide eye and they bounce out of the airplane, go, that is so cool. When can I do that again? Um, and then we start growing it. Uh, we've got a new program online called Aero Educate, which supplies teachers with curricula they can use in their classrooms relating to aviation, um, provides kids an outlet where they can earn badges online by going to an aviation museum near them or mm -hmm. taking a young Eagles flight or reading more about aviation and, and so forth. So there are opportunities there. Um, we even have a superhero now, Stan Lee, the inventor of Spider-Man before he passed away back in 2017, gave us a superhero named Avior. And uh, we have comic books with Avior now and put it out four times a year. And, uh, hand them out to kids wherever we are. Uh, we'll hand them out at our museum here in Oshkosh. We'll, we'll send them in the mail to kids. Uh, we have it online where kids can read it. And so again, meeting people where they are to have them entertained and yet learn about aviation in that way. So it's understanding the opportunities, finding out from, from kids, from parents, from teachers, how do they learn? Where, where can we guide them into these areas? And at least get them familiar with EAA, whether it's through a Young Eagles flight, Aero Educate, through the comic book, whatever it happens to be, uh, and then start to connect with us. And so EAA is not a foreign concept to them uh, when we come to it. Uh, for instance, every Young Eagle becomes a student member. And so until they're 18, they can have this membership and uh, they can come to Oshkosh to the event and get a discount. They can be on our website and just like any member can be. And then when they turn 18, hopefully they'll have a familiarity with the membership that they'll want to make it part of their life if they choose to go on in aviation. That's great. That's great. Um, so talk, talk to me a little bit about, you know, your group, your organization, extends membership to anyone that's interested in flight, right? Mm -hmm. So how has that, have you, has that always been broad-based and are there, do you feel there's advantages or disadvantages to that um, approach? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to it. Uh, you know, really when the, the group was started in 1953, it was a small group of about 35 men, all men at the time, uh, who were interested in building and restoring airplanes. And then it grew. Other people heard about it and said, hey, that's cool. Can I get in? And then people go, oh, I like airplanes. I'd like to get, I'm not a pilot yet, but I'd like to be involved. And so a decision was made very early on to say, we will welcome anybody who wants to participate. Our our founder, Paul Poberezny, had a great line one time when somebody asked him saying, you ought to restrict it to just pilots or just aircraft builders. He said, 
you know, who do we tell that they're not welcome to join us? Who do we tell that they should just stay mm -hmm. home? And so we welcome, if you have an interest in aviation, we welcome you because we want to nurture that. We want to bring you into the community and show you how you can be a part of it as well. So um, nice. there definitely are advantages to that because you can reach out to a wider group and help bring that education, that context. And not everybody will become a pilot, but some people will. They'll see this at Oshkosh or at their local EAA chapter fly in. They'll go, man, I always wanted to do that. Well, we can help you do yeah. that. Um, you know, sometimes there's a disadvantage because like any group um, within it, you've got the the true geeks in it, for lack of a better term. I'm an aviation geek, so I'll call myself that. But the people who live and breathe it and nothing else matters in their entire life but this certain thing. And they're going, why do you let these outside people in? And, and we try to explain to them, you know, if 10 of you right now are sitting around the hangar talking about aviation, well, in five years, and maybe eight of you. In 15 years, there may be five of you. In 20 years, there'll be two of you asking why nobody else wants to get into this thing. That's because you didn't nurture it at the beginning and then yeah. welcome those people in. And so um, we know since, uh, unfortunately, we all get older, some people age out of aviation and so forth. Um, you always have to replenish um, to keep aviation alive, to keep any pursuit alive. You always have to have the vitality of of new people, new ideas, um, new thinking, new enthusiasm that comes into a group. Otherwise, it's very easy to get hidebound or rootbound in your thinking. Yeah. Uh, so, Dick, tell me a little bit about your leadership style. <laughs> and, uh, maybe I should let others say about my leadership <laughs> style. It's tough to judge myself, but uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. I, I'm very much a believer in collaboration. You know, we're all in the same soup together. And so let's figure out a way to do it. We, we've got our goal. We've got what we want to accomplish. Uh, we see the end game. And so I, I try to bring people together. Our, our communications department is just two people here. Oh. And so we end up, we've got 150 people on staff. And so we end up working with every single group. And sometimes you have to build the alliance or, or build the enthusiasm for a certain idea or be the the intersection of where people come together saying, oh, yeah, hey, I know somebody in marketing has an idea about that. Let me bring it over here to business development and see if we can bring that together. So um, I'd like to think that we can bring people together like that. And, uh, you know, we've all had a variety of bosses through our years, and uh, I've learned from good ones, and I've learned from bad ones as well as to what I don't <laughs> want to do. And, uh you know, we always have to remember if we have a staff, um, there's a person inside of that. There's a person going through their own mm -hmm. stuff, whatever their life happens to be. And so you have to make sure that you're empathetic with that and you know, keeping the organization goals uh, primary, but keeping the people goals even higher and saying, you know, you're here because we want you here. And so let's work to find out how we can make you the best, most effective that you can be. And if we can do that and get you enthused about it, well, then we've got uh, a missionary for what we're trying to do as an organization. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point. I like that you said that, that people are all dealing with their own stuff because mm -hmm. uh, I've been saying that a lot lately, everybody has their own stuff that, you know, and I think it's actually even more, I think you guys, you guys are back at the office, right? Or we have been right. You. You yeah, know. yeah. 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 But for those that are still working remote, I think it's also very challenging in this environment um, that you don't know what's going on with people. Like at the office, you can see, oh, Sherry's moping over there, like she's having a bad day. You can visually see that. But I might be on a Zoom meeting with you and then, you know, turn it, that it, off and oh, it's, it yeah. makes it really challenging. So, yeah, it, it really does, Sherry. You know, and that's the one thing that we've talked about too is, how do you reach out to people if they are in a remote situation to make sure that they they feel part of the group? Some people work better individually in a remote situation, and it differs from person to person. But yeah. you still have to make sure that they're part of the team, that you're one of us. You know, we, we've looked at each other through all these little boxes for the past two years, and you know, it's um, it's very easy to get fatigued with that and not really feel connected as humans. Um, yeah. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I, I like the office. So, you know, I certainly can work remotely, but there's something, um, as I said, I came out of broadcast journalism and there's something about the vibe of a newsroom when things are going yeah. strong that you never forget. And, um, you know, we try to bring that kind of enthusiasm here to the office as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, uh, how is technology, um, being used to advance your communication goals? Uh, in every way possible, I guess what we can do, it's, uh, you know, we talked about social media before, and, and that's just a part of it. Um, when things occur, let's say during our venture, when things occur, getting out that, that messaging right away, uh, what we do as far as a video conferencing, uh, what we do as far as, as reaching out with immediacy, you know, the, the days of sending out the news release, waiting for the reporters to call, um, that's, yeah. it still exists, but it's, it's much diminished, you know, uh, what we're doing here as far as podcasts and so forth, uh, getting out there to talk about people, as you look at communications, it's become so much, uh, of a larger pie now, um, so many more tools, but so much more time that's needed to really operate the tools. Well, uh, there's never a shortage of ideas, but how do we make it most effective? And sometimes it might be, um, we st have started using video a lot more uh, in all of our social media feeds. You know, of course, TikTok is given to that. But even with Twitter and Facebook, we, we've found how much more effective it is to have a piece of video or have a photo along with that to communicate what we need. Um, a lot more FAQ sheets because people want to know the why behind things. And so we try to set that up in programs to say, why are we doing this? What is the end game and so forth? And, and so we can bring people along the same thought process that we had when we went through it, because we figured the questions would be very much the same. So um, new technology has become part of it. It's, um, and again, that's the good side, uh, bad side in aviation. Occasionally there are accidents. Uh, it's, um, for instance, uh, as we record this, we had the one down in Texas just this past weekend where we had a couple of vintage warbirds that collided midair oh, yeah. and, uh, you know, very, a very sad situation down there. And, you know, some of those are, are well-known people to us and well-known organizations. Um, and instantly we need the technology to reach out immediately to people, not only our members to say, here's what we know going on. Here's our our statement of condolence to those involved, uh, but also to the media that may be reaching out. Uh, since we own World War II aircraft, they're reaching out to us. I've done a lot more Zoom calls in the past two years you know, than I had done video conferencing in the 28 before that. Yeah. Um, you know, TV stations now accept Zoom calls as a, a proper way to interview. They would never do compute before COVID, they would never do computer based cameras as a live TV interview. And now, you know, I probably do three, four of them a month uh, just oh, wow. because, you know, that those type of things saying, well, can we get you on zoom? Sure. You know, we'll do it that way. So it really has changed just recently in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've noticed that because sometimes I'm watching a, a television show and I was like, well, and they don't even care that it's like, the zoom feed was bad or something and then they've just adjusted. And I was like, wow, we wouldn't have seen that two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> right? it is. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's um, it, it has changed so much and we have to be ready to be flexible with it. Yeah. So what advice would you give association leaders for success over the next few years? As we kind of look ahead. Yeah. I think we touched upon that just in the last question, you know, just the flexibility you need uh, having the goal, having the mission, is solid as the foundation is so important uh, to say, this is who we are. Uh, this is where we're going. And this is why, you know, our mission is growing participation in aviation by, by sharing the spirit of aviation. That's our mission statement. It's, it's very short. We, we don't want a complex. Um, but within that, you have to be flexible to say, okay, here's an opportunity. Um, you know, as I've I told my kids, it's it's great to chase your passion, but chase the opportunity as well. Is there yeah. something there that we can introduce more people to our world? Uh, sometimes we hear it from our members and our chapters with great ideas that they'll bring forward and will incorporate. Um, 
you know, the COVID situation has brought things upon us, you know, for, for a big event. It was the first time we had advanced ticketing uh, beforehand where you actually were sent your wristbands prior to it, because then we could say, we won't have the big lines out front. Let's work on the technology to do it. So having your goal, having your mission in place as your foundation that everybody can look at, and then being flexible enough and giving your people that flexibility to make those decisions and come up with ideas, you know, sometimes even not work out to fail at something uh, it is so important because it, it encourages growth. It encourages new thinking. It encourages innovation. And uh, we certainly need that. And we're seeing that in aviation now with urban air mobility and electric powered airplanes and everything else. So we as an organization have to have that same type of thinking. So, Dick, do you think that EAA's business model will change in the future? Or if not, why not? Or, and if so, why? Uh, the business model, I, I don't believe, will change a great deal, Sherry. Mm -hmm. uh, what it still will be, it really comes down to the member helping member in the way through. And we mm -hmm. help facilitate that, whether it's through chapters, through our programs and so forth. So the basic model won't change. It's interesting because you read things about how uh, newer generations are not joiners. We think they are joiners. They just join in a different way than those of us who may have joined the the Chamber of Commerce or the, the Lions Club or the Kiwanis Club or an organization um, 30, 40 years ago. So they're joiners. That sense of community is still so important. So the business model will be there. The tools we use will no undoubtedly change. I don't see any way technology changes things, uh, cultures change, and so forth. And so we'll change that to make sure we bring it to people wherever they happen to be. That's great. Well, Dick, you've had some great thoughts and advice today. I could probably sit and talk with you for hours. So uh, this has been great. Um, and I appreciate your time. So uh, we would also want to thank our listeners today and hope everybody's enjoyed this episode as much as I have. Um, and so Dick, if somebody wants to contact you or learn more about EAA, how do they do that? Best thing to do, go to our website, eaa.org. It's real simple, eaa.org, O-R-G. Um, or get hop on one of our social media feeds. Um, you know, fortunately, we've got it to the point. We got in early enough where Twitter, Facebook, it's, it's twitter.com slash eaa, facebook.com slash eaa. So you can go to that and uh, hop on that. So, or just reach out to me here uh, at communications at eaa.org. Uh, always happy to talk shop with anybody who are communicators out there or other association people, uh, because we share many of the same goals, the same dreams, the same challenges and so forth. And so how do we attack those in the future? Well, this is great, Dick. I really appreciate your time and maybe I'll uh, make it up to Air Adventure uh, next year. Do so. We'll show you an airplane <laughs> or a thousand or something. Like awesome. That. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Talk to you thank soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye now. We hope you enjoyed this episode and discovered tips and information that will add value to your leadership style and your association. .org Source specializes in positioning teams for success with solutions for technology, strategy, and marketing please contact us at info at orgsource.com or visit www.orgsource.com to find out how to keep your organization on track to Association 4.0.